Hi, I'm David Dorier with PresentYourWayToSuccess.com, and I am so excited to be on the online prosperity show this week. My business is PresentYourWayToSuccess.com. I work with subject matter experts, trainers, to help them craft a great message and to engage their audience, because talking and telling ain't training or selling. So sit back, enjoy tonight's episode of the Online Prosperity Show. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we explore the keys to personal and professional growth. And I'm your host, Prosper Taruvinga. And boy, do we have a magnificent guest today. I have the privilege of speaking to the dynamic professional speaker, trainer, and coach, David Duria. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Prosper, for inviting me to be on your show. I've been following you for quite some time, and I am so excited to now be a part of your show. Fantastic. Well, the feeling is mutual, David, and thank you so much for your service. Now, for those that are just um, getting to meet David, um, you're in for a treat today because David has over 25 years of experience in the field of training and development, leadership and communication. And David is here to share a wealth of knowledge and expertise with us. Now, he's known for his engaging style and ability to simplify complex um, concepts. And David is usually a sought after speaker at industry conferences, corporate events, and educational institutions nationwide. Now, David, I could go on and on, but since we have you here, tell us a little bit about um, you know, how you got started on this journey and what it is that you're doing currently. Well, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that. Well, it didn't start naturally. I'll, ha I, I'll have to say that. When I'm growing up as a kid in Long Island, New York, um, when I meet folks that I graduated high school with, many of them say, well, I didn't even know you could talk because I was such a shy, introverted kid. I'm still very shy and introverted. However, God or somebody else had some other plans for me because through my time in the military, I ended up in career fields that put me up in front of people on a daily basis as a trainer in the military, eventually being a radio broadcaster, eventually being an actor on stage in community theater, eventually being a trainer in corporate America, and then eventually training trainers and training CEOs and so on to be better communicators. And then Toastmasters. So this little shy kid has ended up in a career that has put me up in front of people and I love it. Fantastic. That's a great story of where you are is temporary. You know what I mean? You're just as a timid kid, so many people blame their childhood or who they have become based on, you know, what has happened with them uh, as they grow up. Now with you, this was a completely different story. I mean, you're telling us that you were a timid child and now you're a distinguished expert. Where was the flip? Do you actually know what actually happened for you to change, um, you know, from being timid to distinguished? You know, that that's a great question. I, I think start, it started with radio broadcasting. While I was still active duty in the military, I was stationed on Guam. I always had a desire to be in radio. I never knew how I was going to do it. Growing up as a kid, I had a transistor radio underneath my pillow and just was fascinated with the whole business of radio as a listener. So in the early 80s, I had an opportunity to go down to the local AM radio station in Guam. And one thing led to another. And within a week, I was on the air. And I still have my very first recording and it sounds very different than how I sound today. The, but that when I, just that first time on the air, I felt even though it was very manual back then, it was still records. Everything was uh, the board. You had to know where your hands were and turning this on and that off and so on. And it just came natural to me. And that then became uh, I, that's why I came off active duty and went into the reserves was to pursue fame and fortune in radio broadcasting. So that put me up in front of people, which I didn't realize radio would put me in front of people. 
You know, I thought I'd be in my own little room, but that was kind of the start of it. Then I started acting in theater, found that it, there was a lot to learn. It didn't come natural. So the theater and then the Air Force, the reserves invited me. They said, hey, because of the, your background and because of the number of years you've been in this career field, we want you to be a trainer. We're going to train you to be a trainer so you can train people coming into our career field. So that's kind of how the ball just started, kept rolling. Fantastic. That's such a diverse uh, range of experiences and uh, things that you took a leap on. And now you are this distinguished expert that's helping other people um, communicate their way uh, through business and their personal lives. Now, I mentioned this diverse range of experiences, you know, your, res your radio hosting, you being a performer, um, a voice artist, and even Santa Claus. It has actually shaped your approach to uh, public speaking and uh, coaching. Is this something that may have come naturally? Because what I'm trying to pull out here is some people will always be say maybe that's not for me and they miss out on the actual, um, you know, communicating that would actually help them either sell or be able to uh, train their people. So, uh, so uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's those people that are not taking, are, are missing opportunities and not taking full advantage of maybe their talents that they have within them. And yes, so I think what speaking is certainly one of those talents. I believe that, well, first of all, let me say, because many people will say, well, I'm so nervous when I get up and speak. You know, the number one fear is speaking in public. The number two fear is dying. So stealing a joke from Jerry Seinfeld, we'd rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. Uh, but let me say this, that being nervous is normal. So if you get up in front of a group of people and you feel nervous, guess what? You are normal. All speakers should be norm uh, should be should be nervous. I get nervous getting up in front of a group of people. I was nervous here today before I was speaking with you. Uh, and, and it's normal. And I feel that if someone is not nervous, if they don't have anxiety, then they're not trying hard enough. So with that behind us, I think th there are a few things that separate the good from the great. And in the great, being a proficient communicator, being a good speaker, being a good trainer, being able to get up in front of an audience and being confident in front of an audience is going to separate those good employees from the great employees. Because I feel that when it comes time to give someone a promotion, there's a lot of factors that are looked at. But that one individual who has been getting up in front of people, commanding that audience, they're going to be looked at a little bit differently than the rest. Fantastic. Now, that timid child is the one that's speaking from the podium. And I really like that Seinfeld reference that you mentioned that a few other people would definitely rather be in the coffin than the one uh, saying out the eulogy. Now, this is something that can be trained, right? And could you tell us a little bit more about your coaching style and how you actually integrate adult learning theory into your presentations and workshops? All right. Great question. So, it's my coaching is all about the team. It's all about the individual. It's all about their goals. So if, if you and I were working together and I was, we were working one-on-one, -on -one, I'd first want to understand what are your goals? What are your aspirations? What are you struggling with? What do you do good at right now? And what is it specifically that you need to work on? So my coaching is all about the team and, and the individual. And then we start going into processes. We, If it's a speech that needs to be written, then we'll start designing the speech. Then there's methodologies. You mentioned the, the adult learning or the, the, the engagement principles, talking about those. Before getting into some of those engagement principles, I may have to focus on the real foundational skills, which I call the ABCs of speaking in public. A is for agenda, B for beliefs, and C that there are five core communication skills. 
no matter where you're communicating, you, there are five core skills. So it's all about the team. It's all about the objectives. It's not about me and my goals. It's all about you and your goals. Fantastic. And I like the ABCs that you've just brought to our attention there. Um, but what are some of the common challenges that maybe individuals and organizations face when it comes to effective communication and how do you actually help them overcome these challenges? Yeah, great question. So there's there's two there's two buckets of client that I work with. And, and let me let me start with one of those buckets, and that's the trainer. There are many in, in many organizations, the trainers have been promoted into that position because of their subject knowledge more so than their ability to train or to facilitate others. So there the struggle is how best to convey this information to an audience without overwhelming them. In many cases, the trainers are coming into the room and just vomiting information. And and, and they just and, and not to make them wrong, but they just don't they just don't know. That's why I've got the sign behind me, talking and telling ain't training or selling because there's got to be engagement. There, there is a, there's a process to it. Facilitation is not something that comes natural. It's something that has to be learned. So in the trainers, it's helping them to be able to engage their audience so it increases the sticky factor so the audience will, will remember and retain that information. Now, the individual that I work with, they come to me with a variety of things, but I think at the core is, is, is having a better understanding of how to craft a message that's going to engage their audience. In many cases, a, a lot of the folks that come to me are, are networkers, and they want to give a speech at a networking event or they have made speeches at networking events. It just isn't working. And in many cases, they they just they're they're missing a couple of things. They they they're not thinking about who their audience is. They haven't really thought about how to recraft their message so it's more engaging. So I work with trainers to help them be more engaging. I work with business owners and subject matter experts that also want to be more engaging. Fantastic. And the people that you um, purport to work with would always have to present themselves um, in the shortest amount of words possible. And in my traps, we call it the elevator pitch. Um, I'm not quite sure if that was still the case within um, the last two years of the pandemic where you had to give six feet um, separation. But what advice would you give to someone who wants to maybe improve their elevator pitch and make a more memorable, um, you know, impression in a very short amount of time? Great question. So it comes down to a couple of things. One is knowing your audience. Who are you talking to? And the second is what is your objective? That when you finish your elevator pitch, whether it's 30 seconds, whether it's one minute, whatever length of time it is, when you get to the end of that elevator pitch, what is it that you want people to remember? Or what do you want them to do next? In many cases, the elevator pitch is designed in a way to get the person you're talking to to ask a question. So you don't want to give everything away in your elevator pitch because, number one, you're going to overwhelm them with too much information. But you want to give them just enough information that says, that where the other person says, well, tell me more about that. Hmm. Fantastic. And you actually did that now. I want you to tell us a little bit more about that. And that was a really good uh, play on what you're talking about. But in talking to people, there's, like you said, you were, you had, you know, a, a bit of uh, anxiety or fear when you were sort of coming to the show. I mean, obviously you, you're just saying that to be nice. Um, and there's times where you are talking to someone and you feel like you really just need to let them know everything, um, you know, just so that they have an understanding of who you are, what you do and why they should care. And I think that's a mindset issue that just really needs to be changed. Now, what role 
does mindset play in effective communication and how can um, individuals sort of develop a confident and positive mindset when they're speaking to, uh, in public? Hmm. That's a good question. So, uh, well, well, the first thing that came to my mind is that the 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 mindset is it's it's not about you know when I, if I'm going to explain what I do, it's not about me. It's not about yes, my background is important. Yes, my education, my experiences, all of those things have brought me to where I'm at today. But it's it's it the mindset should be what can I do for you? What is it that I have that's going to benefit you? my background, my military, my acting, my radio, all of that's great, but how does that help you? It, it, a lot of people will talk about, well, I've graduated this, I've taken this course, I've done this, I've done that, I've done all of these things. Well, all of that's great, but how does that help me? So it's the mindset should be, what is it that I have that's going to be a benefit to you in your life? Absolutely. And you keep referring to people's backgrounds because I see a lot of coaches and consultants, especially the whole lot of them that are in our audience um, using, um, you know, what, what I've now started calling the alphabet soup of the courses that they have done, CAP, CAF, CPM, all of those things. And I feel like it's only, uh, you know, addressing their peers, not necessarily their actual audience but it does have relevance for them to stay um you know relevant within the, their peer group or their individual um you know confidence but for you as a retired u.s air force um you know member and thank you for your service once again how has that military background sort of influenced the way you now approach the world right now especially leadership and communication has that played a part or was that just yet another pin on your decorated uniform? Well, I think that that the, with my military career, the 10 years active duty and being along with that, I got to travel to places that many people only dream about, lived, was stationed on Guam, Korea, Philippines, Hawaii, a uh, number of places in the States. While I was in the reserves, I was in Germany, Saudi Arabia, so being able to experience other cultures and to work with people from other cultures certainly was an eye opener for me. The military, from day number one, I realized that mommy wasn't here to do my laundry. Mommy wasn't here to make my bed. So I had to learn to be independent and resourceful of uh, how to learn how to take care of myself. And one of the other things I learned when I was, uh, once I was in the reserves and, and then working in corporate America, that a lot of companies really uh, value that military, that a prior military member, because they, because we come in with a, a very different mindset to an organization of, of being resourceful, of being willing to to go the extra mile, come in early, stay late, do whatever it takes to get the job done. So those types of values. Uh, one other thing from the Air Force is always do the right thing, even when people aren't watching. So that's always been another part of my life. And then the other thing that the Air Force brought to me was that's where I started my training and development career. Uh, the, uh, and I'm so grateful for that 30 years ago, I knew nothing about the training business other than I knew I knew what trainers were. Uh, and I had a radio background. I had a theater background, but theater and radio is not the same as getting up and engaging an audience on a daily basis. Fantastic. When you started talking about um, making your bed, I remember the speech by Admiral McGraven. Is that William McGraven? about how in the military just making your bed is the be it and end of who you're supposed to be. So things like that, um, you know, really, really st stuck with me. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences there. Now, you mentioned before you finished your last um, statement there that 30 years ago, things were totally different. 30 years ago, the te technology was different. Right now, you are in another continent. I'm in Australia. 
um we're talking we were you know checking our microphones before this would have been a whole production and you mentioned that when you started your radio station you had to manually do it yeah i think there was cassette tapes or <laughs> the records. It was all 45s and lps the, the, uh, the cd wasn't invented yet Absolutely. And I did present a joke to say that um, let's, you know, start the show before we run out of tape, which is something that <laughs> kids for these days don't sort of um, have to experience. Now, how do you stay updated with the latest trends and developments in the in the field of training, in the field of technology? Um, and how do you actually then incorporate that into your work? Because you've worked with the manual stuff. Now it's all digital and we're now moving into a whole new era of AI, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, when I started 30 years ago in training, that was my first exposure of working with a computer on a daily basis, working with all of the uh, Microsoft products, Word and PowerPoint and so on, and working with that on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, learned very quickly 30 years ago that I got to make sure I click that save button a lot because I lost a lot of data without doing that. But anyway, so yes, over the years, it uh, I, I've seen a lot of transitions. In some cases, some of these transitions be came, came because of disasters in the world. Uh, on, for example, 9-11. Prior to 9-11, much of the training in corporate America was being done face to face and people were traveling all over the country. Companies were paying all kinds of monies either to bring in a trainer, move all of their people around for a conference and what have you. But then 9-11 kind of shut that down a little bit. And then teleconferencing, Zoom wasn't around then, but products like this, that teleconferencing boom started that's when the e-learning boom kind of started where companies were starting to move all of their products or all of their training online. So I was a, a part of that as well. And then the uh, recession that hit in 2008, that was another jolt in training because after 9-11, things eased up a little bit with travel, maybe not like it was prior to 9-11, but things eased up a little, but then the recession hit and then boom, no more travel. Everything had to be online. And so being a part of that and designing online training, making that more interactive, seeing more and more companies coming into that space where you could easily design stuff like Articulate and Storyline and Captivate coming online where you, anybody could create online training and, and make it available for, for anyone through a, a learning management system. And then most recently with the pandemic, with Zoom, prior to the pandemic, people, if you said, hey, let's have a meeting on Zoom, let's, let's do a virtual coffee on Zoom, you'd be laughed out of the room. But now, I mean, it's a part of our life. And look at this. I, I, you know, some of this still blows me away that I'm in Atlanta, you're in Australia. How many miles is that separating us from one another? And we're basically in the same room. This is quite incredible. And so along the way, it was also how do we how do we maximize the use of these products? With Zoom, for example, I spent a lot of time training people on how to be better facilitators with Zoom because everybody was saying the same thing was, I can't feel my audience. I'm losing my audience. Well, yes, that's true. So now you got to crank it up to an 11. You've got to change things up a little bit to, to, uh, to engage your virtual audience. It's not impossible. It's different. I'll give you that, but it's not impossible to keep them engaged. Fantastic. And it seems like you do have, um, you know, solutions to those sort of uh, challenges that people are facing. If people are being all zoomed out, you can bring them back into the same room with their audiences. Now, what would be the best way that people can actually uh, get started with working with you there, David, and maybe um, how they can actually learn a little bit more about how you can help them be do and have a business that's profitable and enjoyable? Well, thank you for that question, Prosper. The best way is through my website, presentyourwaytosuccess.com. And on my website, you're going to find all over the place on there, you're going to find a button that says, schedule a meeting with me. 
And if you schedule that 30 minute meeting with me, it is basically a free coaching session for 30 minutes. And I'm not going to do any selling during those 30 minutes. If you want to take things a next step, we can talk about that. But it's going to be more about learning about you, learning about your goals. And I'm going to give away some, some tidbits of information, something that might be challenging you. So go to my website, presentyourwaytosuccess.com. Let me know that you heard heard this on, on Prosper's podcast. And I will be more than happy to to give a complimentary 30 minute coaching session. And I'll also share some resources and also on LinkedIn. I post every day on LinkedIn on helpful tidbits on how to be a better presenter. Fantastic. I've just followed you on LinkedIn. So don't leave me hanging, sir. Now, obviously, if people are really excited about what you have to offer, especially just with this complimentary uh, call, can you just maybe share with us a success story of someone or even an individual or an organization that you have coached or trained, just really highlighting the impact of your guidance and how their communication skills and, um, you know, overall success improved? Yeah. Great question. The The one that always pops up into my head first is a gentleman who recently separated from the army and took a sales role with a nationally known insurance company. He, he knew that he could be successful at this job. He, he liked speaking when he was in the army. He, he enjoyed the prospect of being in sales at some point and knew that he could be effective. However, he was struggling. He was struggling because of a couple of things. One, that transition from military life into civilian life. But the thing that we focused on was that I'm not a sales coach. I'm a presentation skills coach. But what we worked on was it because all he was doing was talking and what he needed to flip things around a little bit and and ha and ask more questions to get into his prospects head a lot more he needed to also incorporate stories into his selling by 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 incorporating more questions by listening more by incorporating stories he has tripled his sales and he is now a mentor for other folks that are coming on board in this new sales role. Fantastic. He has been beaten by the Doria bug, I must say, because obviously if you can talk and put your um, you know, communication skills out there and like you say, talking and telling and training or selling. Okay. Now, Last but not least, you did mention you've got a radio station and I've been trying to tune in to that uh, station now. And um, you seem to have a unique mix of music um, that you actually offer. Now, how did you venture into this space? Well, this is going back to uh, 2015. I started this internet radio station, uh, CLIradio.com, which stands for Classic Long Island Radio, uh, because of the inspiration I had from when I was a, a kid growing up on Long Island, uh, it's it's morphed into what it is today. Today, it it is a, what I call an album-oriented rock station from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Lots of deep cuts, lots of songs that people would recognize, but lots of songs from artists that 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 people have no idea. Now, I, I didn't know all of these people, uh, all of these artists. I have about 8,000 songs that are on the station. It's it's all automated, no commercials. You will hear my voice every once in a while doing a promo of some sort. But it's um, I've got listeners all over the world. It's a passion of mine. It's more of a hobby. I don't make any money off of it. I wish I could. But I, I have listeners all over the world. And and uh, thank you so much for bringing bringing it up. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for your time on the show today. 
um, you know, and really letting us know the ins and outs of communication and how you have actually uh, gone from, um, you know, the timid child to this now accomplished expert. Thank you so much there, David. Thank you, Prosper. Fantastic. Now, please help me thank uh, David for sharing his valuable insights and experiences with us today. It's been an honor to have you, Sarah, on the show. And to our listeners, if you're interested in taking your public speaking skills to the next level, be sure to reach out to David for a complimentary coaching session like he has offered. And remember, effective communication is the key to unlocking your full potential. And I encourage you to join us next time on the Online Prosperity Show as we continue to explore the tools and strategies for personal and professional growth. Until next time, stay prosperous. Bye for now.